Um, hi, everybody. We're back. <laughs> we had an internet glitch, unfortunately, and by we, I say me. And I don't know what happened. <laughs> but um, this will be part two of the discussion, which will also be uploaded. All of the live streams can be found under our live stream tab on YouTube. Sometimes they don't show up on the front page, and we don't know why. Um, if we can manually upload it after the fact, we'll try to do so. But um, we were just talking about Sidovacantism and how Joe um, was part of that movement for quite some time. And um, we were talking about Anarius, right? Yeah, Anarius. And I, I was basically, and I want people out there that watch this to know if there are people out there that hold the Sidovacantus view. I'm not saying these things in a way to initiate some kind of like or instigate debate um, or anything. I'm just kind of sharing. All I could say is it's it's just my experience of things that made sense to me at a certain time in my life. Um, if, if that's the best way I could say it, these are just like it's it's these are the reasons why I went to one direction of the of the spectrum and then to another, then to another. You know, so I've been all over the spectrum when it comes to these topics. That that's the whole thing, and I've studied a lot from different angles. But the point I was making was that when I was emailing back and forth with St. Genis about Sidovacantism, um, you know, in that time, certain topics came up. One of those topics happened to be about Pope Inarius, and I And that was a particular one for me. Now, others may disagree with my take on it. And, you know, maybe down the road, they want you guys want to question it. And that's fine. I, I'm, again, I'm not knocking anything at this point. I'm just saying that that time in my life, that argument stayed with me is the best the best point i can make it it it, it stayed with me to think about like here you have a pope who was condemned as a heretic but still listed as pope and it i thought in my mind it's it also shows you why it's important to have a magisterium involved in making that determination even with all the arguments of, of ipso facto taken aside for us as the laity to have certainty it's important to have involvement that way from higher authority Otherwise, we're all running around saying, well, this is what it is, what it is. And I know for a fact, it's like, at the end of the day, we're just lay people. You know, it was hard. Are you and, saying it's an opinion? Yeah, that's a good way to say it. it I do. Th so, yeah, I will say it is, it's It's an opinion that I'm not even saying I'm opposed to myself. I want to make that clear. I'm just all I'm saying is at that time, in my life, at that age of my life, these arguments were compelling to me. And at the time, it caused me to. Think maybe I what if I've been wrong this whole time? In other words, what if I've been wrong? Because if it is an opinion to hold, I came across at it like this is dogmatically, this is what it is, right? That was my my take at that age. So I'm, I'm not talking opinion, I'm talking about you better think this or else you're wrong. Okay. And yeah, I was very firm on it, and all of a sudden, now for the first time, I'm worried thinking, man, what if I've been wrong this whole time? What if I, you know, and I mean. I had family members that were coming to the chapel with us and all these things because um, I because I convinced them. I thought, what if I led them wrong? What, what if there's something I'm missing? What if there's something I don't know? You know, that was the first time I can remember since my reversion where I was aware of the fact that I don't know everything. But in my pride, I like to come off like I do know everything. You see that that distinction there? It's yeah. always like I, I want people to feel, wow, Joe knows this stuff. At the same time, in my mind, there's so much I don't know, and I'm aware of that. That time in my life really revealed that to me. It made me uneasy because there were people looking at me like, okay, Joe, tell us what to think. And I'm like, man, I don't know myself right now. I, it was hard. Um, I remember having to tell Carol Ann and tell family members and friends, like, you know, what if I'm wrong on this? What, you know, and if I'm wrong, where do we go? Like, I didn't even know. It, it, the whole thing was so confusing to me. And all I can say is at that time, you know, um, I, uh, I, I it's funny because even at that time, you know, that's when uh, the Novus Ordo Watch website had, was taken off, and I knew the person who edited and owned that website, and we were in talks about me contributing more and having more responsibility with it. And all of a sudden, it's like, hey man, I don't know if I really, I don't know what I think anymore right now. I'm kind of, you know, I'm mixed. And you know, and, uh, and anyway, I remember him calling me on the phone and trying to convince me, and I'm just like, I don't know, I don't have, you know. So it was, it was a hard thing for me. It. It was a pride killer, but also, too, it really messed with my head. It, like my identity, I, I use people use the word identity crisis. I didn't know what to think or believe at a certain point when that happened. I'm like, wait, if I've been so headstrong on this, 
and I, and I could be wrong. I mean, what else could I be wrong on? What if my next decision is wrong? Like I was just second guessing everything, uh, which is not a good place to be in life, right? It's just not. And um, I remember I stopped going to the chapel. Um, I went through a brief period of time where I had read a book by, and, and he's now since passed away, but the man's name was David Bodden. Some of you out there know him as uh, Pope Michael I. He passed away last year. And, you know, for all the internet jokes I see about him being like the, the you know, the self-made Pope with 12 followers, I always tell people I, I interact with him both by phone and email. And I have, I can't say anything bad about him. He's just one of the, the holiest, most humble people I ever met. I mean, I, and you remember, Nina, I was genuinely saddened to hear he passed away. I didn't agree with him's claim to being Pope, but I was saddened to hear he passed away. I always thought in a, in a lot of ways he was a force of good, given the crisis we're in uh, with the things he taught. But he was a very just nice, humble person. And I came across some of his material at, at a time and read his stuff and had talked with him a bit. Um, and basically what I came to was like, okay, well, if, you know, if what he's saying is correct, not that I, I recognize him as Pope Michael, but just as the points he's making are correct, that would mean that there's no church for me to go to anywhere near me where I live. And Caroline and I became state home aloneers. They call it the, the home alone movement, you know, and that we'd stay at home. There's nowhere to go. Um, I can remember Sunday after Sunday, Caroline asking me, are you positive? This is correct. We're supposed to stay here. And I didn't know. I was like, I don't know. I, I hope it is. I, I think it is. See, and that's the hard thing being a point in life where I was so uncertain about my own thoughts. I was so uncertain about my own studies. Um, it was very hard because every time I would read a book, I would think, well, what if there's a book out there that refutes this book that I haven't read yet? You know, I, I was just in this mode. Yeah, of it, that, it is really hard. Um, but, you know, to, to a point, there are a lot of people that can't go to church right now because all they yeah. have access to is a Novus Ordo. And I know that, you know, someone could hear that and say, wow, that's really extreme. You're saying stay home if all I have is a Novus Ordo. And it took me like, you know, a few years to come to that conclusion. Um, even last year, I probably would have said, no, you can go. I mean, not last year, but maybe in like the beginning of last year or the year before. Um, so as we learn new things, like conclusions can change, which is why. Mm -hmm. I feel inconclusive on the issue and I just try to kind of stay out of it. Um, and I just try to stick to what the church has always taught. And um, I try to stay in a state of grace because what I'm learning is like, it, it can be a pride thing to make it your thing, like where you have to figure this out and, you know, yeah. or like if, if you don't, if you don't think this way or like if you don't think, if you think Francis is Pope, then you're a pseudo trad. But if you, you know, if you, if you don't think he's Pope, then you're schismatic. And I don't think either are true. No. Um, I think that it's complex and it can take people a lot to arrive at decisions and that people want to be careful yeah. And for me, it's just like, I don't have all the information. I don't have the necessary help of the Holy Ghost to figure it out. And I, I really mean that. Like, I can I can tell you from what I can see, there's something very wrong with uh, the present person who says he's Pope. And there, but then there's people that will say, oh, well, it's just Francis. But it's like, no, the, what about Benedict? What about John Paul II? And everybody since... Um, John, John the 23rd, the 23rd, there's been serious, serious issues and serious heresy, serious apostasy. So I'm not like in a camp with that. And it's not to be a people pleaser. It's just that it's very complex. And I'd rather just focus on what I do know, which is that I know that I have to try to get to heaven, you know? Yeah. And you say I that. So, you, I can yeah. see why it became confusing to you. Yeah. And by the way, you stated all that so perfectly that that, that resonates so much with me because you know, so that's something that we've talked about in the past, like, you know, there were there were periods in church history where you had legitimate anti-popes and saints on all sides, but, you know, uh, uh, professing the wrong pope, right? but they were still saints at the end of the day. Um, there are times the, the, for the bulk, the vast majority of history, right, technology that we have today is recent. Um you know, I always say nowadays, if Francis sneezes, it makes headline news in seconds. 
It's all across the web. Francis sneezed. You know, it wasn't like that centuries ago. Um, you could go decades of your life not really having any clue what's going on in Rome or the latest council even. You might not know. And priests could take months and months and years to get word from their bishops on what happened in some document. It's crazy. So what did the average person do? They, they were just striving to be holy, live their vocation, sanctify their family, be obedient to what they knew to be church teaching. That's what they would do, you know? Right. And, uh, and in a lot of ways, that's the path for most of us today. Um, and I love how you said that, though, because yeah, it takes humility to have to conclude, I don't really know on certain topics. And maybe that's because it's uh, it's above my pay grade, as they say. I'm, I'm you know, I'm. Yeah, I really don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, it's, I'm, it's like I tell people now I'm, I'm more used to telling people I'm a lay person. Like, I know people listen to me. Wow, Joe knows his stuff. That's great. I've read lots of books, but I'm still just a lay guy. I'm, anyone can read the books I've read and come to the same things I have. It's it's just whatever. I'm a, I'm a lay person. I'm no one's authority. Uh, right. Yeah, I'm a, yeah, that's just the reality. I do know this. I do know that, like, and I, I, I would have felt so scrupulous saying this like two years ago, and you know this. Um, even like maybe a little bit a year ago saying it publicly but i will say publicly with no scruple that these people who sit in the chair of peter have seriously defected from the catholic faith like that it's yeah. not the catholic faith that's being yeah. taught so i think all of that's reasonable but i think you know with what you said like you're you're teaching it sort of in this dogmatic way you start to question it you start to worry about your soul so what happens next for you um I, uh, yeah, I, I was just a, a mix of thoughts and I didn't know what to think. And so here, here's the funny part in the middle of all of this, at this stage in my life, as I'm trying to make sense of what to do and where to go. Um, and I, this is where I also discovered certain independent chapels around me and SSPX first time, the first time ever I, I started reading Lefebvre was in this period. I read, um, I read, uh, what is it? Um, is it against the heresies where he comments on the encyclicals of the post, post, -Vat the pre-Vatican II popes. And a letter to confuse Catholics. Okay. Oh yeah. My first time ever reading Lefebvre, and I was, and I, I love Letter to Confuse Catholics. It was such a great book. Um, I, so I had this renewed this 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 uh, appreciation for Lefebvre. Went to my first SSPX chapel, researched Indy. I started going to independent Latin masses because I thought that's a safe place. It's independent. It's Latin mass, you know. Um, and you get to learn all sorts of different opinions out there from other traditional Catholics. But in the mix of all the confusion. One day I get a phone call out of the blue from my old buddy, Jesse Romero. And Jesse says, hey, you know, Jesse had heard through the grapevine that I had left. That I, what was that? He heard that I wasn't going anymore to the chapel that taught saving consciousness. That's the best way to say it. That I was questioning saving yeah. consciousness. He had heard about that. He calls me and says, hey, let's go get lunch and talk and catch up. So we go get lunch. We talk. And I'm telling him everything I've been going through. And I'm confused. I don't know what to think right now. And I'm going to this Latin mass down the street. And it's in, it's inside of a, a hotel room or it's inside of a woman's center. And it's it's independent. And, you know, and Jesse says, okay, Joe. And again, keep in mind that my state of mind at this, at this time in my life, I didn't know. I was very confused to know what to think or what to do. And I was a right. spy. I needed someone to give me clear guidance on here's what you should do. So Jesse says, Joe, listen to me. He said, I'm going to a church right now, not far from here. It's in the middle of what's called the projects, meaning this is a very impoverished area surrounded by youth who are in gangs, into drugs, parents are in prison, and that church needs a youth minister. He said, and Joe, you're young. You're still early, mid-20s. You have this beautiful gift of knowledge God gave you. You know what it's like to be lost when you're in your teenager, to be lost and angry and do dumb things. And you know that life, you know that world, because I did. He said, you know, these teens need you. They need a guy like you. And he said, you're so busy being distracted by all these thoughts of, but the council and the Pope and the Masons, and you're, you're missing the more important picture right in front of you. And that picture is reaching the lost for Christ and bringing souls to Jesus. And these kids need you. I'm hearing him out. It's almost like I'm hearing a pitch, right? I'm just hearing out what he has to say. He says, why don't you call me just to go visit the church, meet the priest. Let me show you the area. I'll take you right now. I'm like, all right, so we're driving there. It's where he tells me, he says, now you need to know this is no, it's Noah's Ordo. And I hadn't been in Noah's Ordo now in a while, right? I hadn't been there. And it's been some time. And I'm like, okay. I said, I don't know how I feel about that. He said, Joe, he's got to, wait till you meet the priest. Wait till you meet the people. I said, all right. So I met the priest. Priest was a very conservative, what you expect from a conservative Noah's Ordo priest, right? 
He also was in tune with the, the reality of modernism. He was in tune with the reality of Freemasons wanting to infiltrate. So he knew those things. He had his own take on it, but he knew those things. He just had a different conclusion, you could say, a different opinion, whatever. I'm hearing him out. Then we start walking the projects, and I'm meeting some of these kids, talking to some of their parents. And it, it, it's exactly like Jesse described it, and it was sad. Um, just a lot of lost people, broken people. Teens are just in gangs and drugs and not knowing what to do with their life. And it's sad. I mean, I, we met people where you had dads who were in prison uh, for dealing drugs and moms who walk the streets at night. They're just being honest as best I can. And these kids are just running around with gangs. And and Jesse, says, Jesse told me, so I want you to really pray this and think about it. These kids need you, but you're too distracted by these ethereal topics of but John Paul II said this, and like he, and I remember, I'll never forget. I remember vividly we were walking the projects, and there was this this kid outside next to his grandmother, sitting out, what appeared to be his grandma, sitting outside this this rundown, broken house. And just I want you to look deeply in their faces, really quick. He said, "Look at that old lady. Look at that kid." He said, "Do you think they're sitting around right now, thinking to themselves, I wonder what Vatican II has to say about this topic and that topic, and I wonder if Paul is six on about this with the Latin man, he said, do you think they're thinking about those things right now? He said, no, no, they're thinking how they live another day, how they get to heaven. That's what they're thinking about. And he said, so Joe, you're too caught up in all these deeper issues, but these people need Jesus right now. And, and, and you're the guy to give to them because you have that love, you have that zeal, you have the knowledge, they need you. So he was really giving me a powerful visual, you could say, because I'm there seeing these people and I'm going to meet with them. And I, you know, I told Caroline, I don't know what to do, you know, so I basically, long story short, told the priest, okay, I will try this out. I'll be the youth minister, you know, try it out for a few months and see how it goes. The first few Sundays, I'm not going to mass. Why? Because I'm going to my Latin mass, my independent Latin mass. When the priest pulled me aside after a few weeks, said, Joe, we have an issue here. And what's going on? He said, well, it's good that you're helping out around here, but the teens need to see their youth minister at their mass. But we don't even see, we never see you coming. I said, that's because I'm going to the Latin Mass. And he said, okay, Joe, you got to get that. You, he said, you have too much of that traditionalist nonsense in you. You got to get that rooted, uprooted. That was his big word. Get it uprooted out of you. Scrape it out. Look at the number what Jesse told you. Focus on the mission at hand. And I was in such a place at that time where I thought, you know what? Maybe they're right. Maybe I've missed the mission. I've been so focused on studying all these issues. I've just missed the simple mission of we got to save souls. And so I said, I'm going to, I got to make an effort at this. So I started, we started going back to Novus Ordo, which was very, very hard. Anyone out there who knows, who's been to the Latin mass for years, or if you're a state of a conscious, you go to SSPX, to go back to Novus Ordo is like, you know, I mean, again, it's, um, I didn't know, I mean, am I offending God? Am I, is, is our Lord even present in this Eucharist? Is this even a real, all these things go through your mind. You don't know. But I just, I, I was trying to trust in the, in the advice being given to me. I told God, okay, you know, I'm here to just do my part to help out these kids. Hopefully I'm doing right. So I started going. My one thing to the priest at the time, my one rule was I said, I'm not going to do a youth mass. I will never, ever do a youth mass. I was, I, I, I used to drum in them. As I said, I was a drummer in a church choir. And I was so against that now. So I'm not going to do that kind of stuff. He said, okay, I'm never going to ask you to do it. But we don't do that here. I said, okay, great. So I did my youth. I did my youth ministry. Was there for years, four or five years. Saw lives change. I, I mean, legit. Saw kids leaving gangs. Was confronted by gang members. I mean, literally. I, I one time was walking the projects, praying my rosary, and had a guy with a gun walk up to me, uh, a teenager, minister to him right there, talked to them, prayed a rosary. I mean, I mean, I saw crazy things in those years. The rosary is a weapon. It is, yeah, and it's powerful. I mean, I, I one time had two gang bangers approach me at a nearby gas station late in the AM hours, asking where I was from, which, of course, is code for, you know, what gang do you represent, basically? What area do you represent? And I told him, I said, it doesn't matter where I'm from. It matters where I'm trying to go, and that's heaven. And we started getting into a whole talk. That gangbanger had a tattoo of the Sacred Heart of Our Lord. The other gangbanger was wearing a rosary around his neck. And I said, do you see what you're doing? And I pointed to the guy's rosary. I said, do you see who's on the end of that? That's our Lord. This is our lady's rosary. He said, and you're out here worried about where I live. And that is, do you see how petty that is? You know, and I started pointing to the guy's tattoo. Do you, don't you see our Lord right there? That's sacred. Do you know what the sacred heart devotion is? And we start talking about that. And at four in the morning, what's happening? We're on the, the, the we are on the corner of Laurel Canyon Rinaldi on the sidewalk in public with traffic on our knees, praying a rosary, all three of us. Wow. 
those guys converted and got into youth ministry. They did youth ministry themselves. They would visit uh, juvenile halls to minister to kids. They changed their whole life around. So you see how at the time, they're like, I'm doing what God wants. I'm where God needs me to be, clearly. A lot of those kids became my God kids. As you know, Nina, I have many, many God kids. I think I think it's 25, 26 of them now. And most of those I'm God kids. Favorite, so watch out, everyone. The bulk of those God kids were kids that went through the confirmation program, right? Because I taught, I, I led the confirmation program, which was over 250 teenagers years in a row, right? Week to week. I led the confirmation, did all the confirmation retreats. I did the youth nights. I taught adult Bible study. I taught youth Bible study. We did youth hangouts at the local coffee shop, youth hangouts and uh, barbecues in Jesse Romero's backyard. And we did all these different things. I, I taught baptism classes. I, I assisted teaching RCA. So I was so involved at that church, very involved. And out of that, I got tons of God kids in those years, tons of God kids every year. We'd be my sponsor, you know, which is exciting because now, you know, I'll be having a new one very shortly. Coming up very, very shortly. But it's a surprise. I can't tell you who it is unless she wants to say something. Well, <laughs> I am being conditionally confirmed. So. Wait, so Janina, does that mean you're supposed to be my goddaughter soon? Is that what's happening? <laughs> He's on trial. I might fire him. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, but yeah, I got lots of God kids. And I, and I, I, and, you know, traditionalists ask me today, how did you endure the Nova's Order all those years? I tell people I enjoyed my time there because I felt I was doing something important. And here's the thing about human psychology. I'm, I'm being totally open book and honest with everyone today about these topics. The thing about psychology is this. When you feel you're doing the right thing, but your mind tells you there's something that's still off, you will literally try to convince yourself, you know, to no, no, this is the right thing. And you will do what you can to convince yourself it's right. The best way I can explain it, which means I started reading books that that were contrary to my traditionalist literature, right? Counter, I want to see what does the other side think? How can I try to make sense of Vatican II? How can I make sense of those? Or how can I make sense of these things? And what do other people have to say? And have people written about critiques on traditionalism? Oh, there are books out there on that. I'm going to start reading those now. So, I mean, I'm reading everything. I remember at one point in this time telling uh, the telling people, I'm going to write a book that tries to sync vatican II with tradition i'm going to be the guy that writes the book on it and i'm going to have all the references and i'm going through all the documents and going it was, it was crazy so i was trying to convince myself of something different in all honesty so that i could justify me feeling content at this parish why because i'm doing i'm bearing good fruit i'm changing people's lives i'm helping people all these you know it was crazy now i will say also though in that time Blessing happened to me in 2008 was I was introduced to the consecration devotion, St. Louis de Montfort. That was a game changer for me. And some good friends of ours that we're still friends with to this day, Felix family, introduced us to that. I read um, uh, Devotion to the Sacred Heart of Mary. I, I'm sorry, Devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus by the spiritual director of St. Margaret Mary. I read Trustful Surrender to the Divine Providence. These are like spiritual classics I'm being introduced with for the first time. And it changed everything for me. My spirituality increased in that time. Um, but then there came again, like ending the downfall, and the downfall started in a couple ways. But one thing that you know I don't talk enough about is what happened to me at the end of 2007, um, where a, one of my closest friends, Joe Wickman, was killed in a hit and run. And Nina knows the story, and people that know me know this story. And I won't get into all the stuff, but basically, someone was very, very close to me that I bonded with over the course of a year, hung out with almost every day died and this was someone who loved his catholic faith and i mean i'm he was the embodiment for me of someone who wasn't all about just studying it was living his thing was all about living the faith he was like you know i don't understand fancy books and all that but i know what it is to serve someone in need and he would walk the streets of skid row barefoot literally feeding homeless people one time I, I witnessed someone give, give him, they donated him, they donated him a bicycle saying, here, take this. So you have some, you're not walking anywhere. And he took that bicycle to the very nice homeless person and said, Hey, if you need a bike, here you go, man, it's yours. Just gave it away. Gave his shoes away one time. This was like his, the way he lived. And we would talk theology. We talk it. We would walk with each other, the streets talking theology. He always had the rosary always in his hand. He always was carrying a rosary or a rosary ring. He was always, if he wasn't talking for 10 seconds, he was praying. Like that's what he did with his free time, just praying. Um, and we talked theology, and he would say, yeah. He's like, and the theology is important. 
you know, uh, you have to know the truth, he said, but at the end of the day, you also have to live it. So he taught me a lot of things about how to live the faith. We would walk cemeteries praying for the dead and all these things, but he was killed 2007, he, a hit and run. Um, and the best I can say is I went into, uh, I don't know what the word is. I just, it was the first time in years my, my faith felt shaken. I don't mean like losing my faith, like changing to a different religion, not that. I just mean like, struggling with god like why would you take him away you know why take him away from me like you know this guy's my brother um you know he he, he he changed my way of looking at things he changed the way i lived my life he gave me a heart to love people in need and i thought why would you like why take him away he did so much good for the world like i, I wrestled with that and the hard thing is i remember sharing that with someone that went to the church with me served in ministry with me i remember sharing this with that one person alone without saying their name and that person said, Joe, I get it. You're in pain. But here's the thing. You're a youth minister. So you better put on a brave face and not show that cracks, those cracks to anyone else around here. So it, it was, which, by the way, is horrible advice. And I start, I, I, what I tell people now is I basically put on my costume. All right. Here comes happy, confident Bible Joe to teach another day. But inside, I was like breaking. It was hard for me. I started closet drinking really bad, which was a vice during high school that I had gotten past, but all of a sudden the devil came right back to me with it. And all of a sudden now it's horrible. I mean, we're talking like, you know, planning retreats, but being like running to my cabin to like take some quick shots and going back. And, you know, I was just, cause I was miserable. I was depressed and um, felt like a hypocrite, which I was, I was a hypocrite. Um, I was concealing things in spiritual direction from my priest who was also my boss and, you know, and, all these things and he started to catch on to things and you know the thing is vice catches up with you people start to catch on to certain things you you know the bible says whatever's hidden will be or whatever's concealed will be revealed whatever's hidden will come to light it's hard though because the advice they gave you was to conceal yeah exactly and that's why i say it was horrible advice to say hey joe you better you better act like you're okay because these kids need to see you as a rock i should have you know i, I mean i it, i should have just been just taking some time yeah is that time? Talk to people. Talk to my spiritual director. Pray. You know, but don't fake it. Don't just like fake how you feel, you know. Um, so it was hard. I was like basically a walking contradiction. Like I was a liar. And um, it caught up with me. And so he essentially came to a point where I told the priest, you know, look, at, I got I to gotta quit this job. I can't do it anymore. I'm no good to anyone here. Uh, Carol Ann and I was hard. I mean, man, we were just married so many years but i was 24 7 at that church was my life ministry was my life and it took a toll on my marriage when i should have been focusing on my primary vocation as a husband i was just like sorry caroline you gotta take back seat because i got things to do with the church and you better understand because i'm doing the work of god i mean i literally was in that mode i it was sad you know um i wasn't there for any of her needs it was just all about what i was going through you know and um i mean man i would get calls at two three in the morning from people you know, Joe, we need you to come out and help us. All right, I got to leave. I got to go. You know, it's just like, that's how I lived back then. And so I, I told the priest, I said, look, I got to get my notice. I got to leave. At the same time, he's like, yeah, I think it's, I think it's best that you leave. And so it was one of those mutual things where he thought I should go. And I'm like, yeah, I should go. And that ended ministry. Um, that ended it for me. Um, I It was hard because, again, the identity crisis thing hit. I thought, if I'm not a youth minister, if I'm not teaching, who am I? What am I? What's my purpose in this life? You know, and um, of course, you know, what God and what our lady's telling me, your purpose is right in front of you. It's your wife. That's your vocation. It's your marriage. And I'm like, it's weird. I, I, I spent so many years just tracking about other things. I never thought of it that way. So I told, I told myself, told Caroline, I'm laying low. I'm not going to go. I'm not going to take a church job. I'm not going to do that again. Um, I'm not going to you know, challenge the world to debate me, to be a name, to be, I, I'm not going to try to be the next Tim Staples, Scott Hahn. I'm just going to, you know what? My life's going to be simple. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to work a nine to five, make an honest days, pay, pay my bills, love my wife, grow my faith. That's my life. And that's what I called as, you know, my hibernation era. That's the <laughs> way know? to do it though, you know? It is. Yeah, it is. I, I did that for 10 years. Uh, 10 years. I know I, I had a blog that, you know, some people would look at family, friend, I would write articles once in the blue moon. <laughs> Talk to my, you know, anyone that ever had a question about the faith, I talked to them, right? If you had a question, yeah, let's talk. Let's get lunch and talk. I talk to my family, my friends, coworkers. I, but I, I just, I wasn't aiming to like in any way 
get my name out there again. You know, I, I just, that was gone. All that was gone. I'd been through so well, much. I think you, you kind of skipped, you know, this is what I know because I know you, but most people probably don't know is that, you know, when you had connected with Jesse Romero, it opened the door for you to meet so many mm-hmm. other apologists. Like you did mention you, you know, knew Sue Janice, who's, who's an excellent apologist, but um, that you were in that whole apologetics world. Yeah. And that was the years. So the years that I was doing youth ministry, <clears throat> that whole time frame, not, not only was I doing all the stuff at the church, but I was being invited now for the first time to speak at conferences, speak at uh, <laughs> retreats, you know, I mean, speak at all these different things. Um, oftentimes to the, like the, you know, whenever you go to a conference, they'd have like the adult speakers and they would have like the youth room, the youth track. And then oftentimes I was on the youth track because I was a youth minister, but also do being able to, you know, uh, at times, um, come in. If, if some apologist was sick, not feeling good, they couldn't make it. Then I, I could be filled right in joking, give the talk, you know? And I was kind of being groomed in a sense. Like maybe I could be that next level of apologist. You know, maybe I could be there someday because everyone I met, every apologist I met was, in, in trying to be, you know, I'm trying to say this in an honest way, in a humble way, but they were just very impressed with my knowledge. Like, wow, for such a young person, you know a lot of things. And, and you know, I forgot to mention this too, but as you know, I, back then I would, you know, regularly email uh, Protestant apologists and James White and call, call him on the phone and <laughs> talk about, you know, debate. I mean, I, I knew my stuff very well. At least I could say I knew it very well. I Because, and, and that here's the other thing I didn't mention. In those years, the youth minister, all the stuff I had to do at the church was always in the evening, right? Night times. What I do all day, I'll go to Starbucks or some local coffee shop and I would just read, 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 read books. I read so many untold numbers of books in those years, dozens and dozens upon dozens, that my knowledge just started to grow and grow and grow. I was reading every apologetic book under the sun, every book on the, theology, you know, uh, catechesis, the history of the councils, the church fathers, you know. I was reading books by Protestants and seeing what, you know, I mean, I just, I read so much. I learned a lot and I would sponge it by debating people. You know, I mean, I, I would in real time, like asking people, you know, debate me, like, you know, what, what's your issue with the Catholic church? And we'd start going back. I would do that at coffee shops with people. Why aren't you Catholic? Well, let's talk about it, you know, and sharpening my tools. So the, my tools, so to speak, I, you know, and all that stuff. So yeah, I got to meet lots of apologists, got to become friends with them. Um, I remember vividly one time being at a conference where Tim Staples, uh, you know, we, we were talking a whole conversation about me leaving state of ecotism. And he called me out in one of his talks. Uh, it was called The Shocking Truth About the Pope. And it was a talk he was giving. He said, I want to call out Joe Morose. Please stand up and tell them that, you know, my background. And he and I talk a lot. Me and Father Mitch Pack would talk back then. And, you know, I mean, I got to know all these people. And some of them, some of them I got to know on a very personal level and going to homes and eating with them and spending time with their families and and yeah, I, I thought this will be my life. My my goal was not just to be a minister, but it was to eventually become an apologist and write books. And this is, I'll be like the next Scott Hahn. It'll be my career, you know, just like they get to do. And all that, like you said, got taken away when I left youth ministry. And I don't put the blame on anyone else. It got taken away because of my own, my own vices caught up with me. I didn't handle Joe Whitman's death the correct way. Um, well, training and drinking, being depressed, you know, that affected me. But then... Losing sight of my my primary vocation was a big thing. So, right, but also like I think that even though you were in the new order realm, um, obviously good can be done anywhere in the sense that like you're teaching people bits of the truth. Yeah. But I think that you were still. It sounds like you were still battling with. Well, how do I connect all these dots when they yeah. contradict? Because you had mentioned you wanted to write this book that you know, ties in Vatican II with tradition, which can't be done. Um, So it sounds like you were wrestling that. And it sounds like, um, you know, you're saying in one hand, well, you know, I I lost this, but also it sounds like that you needed to, in a sense, leave because you needed the whole faith, which the new order doesn't offer that, you know, there's bits and pieces of the truth, but the big pictures being missed. Yeah. And Not that was, by, in a sense. Yeah. But, that, that, but that, that's one of the things you just said. That's it, it's so true. It's, it's stated so perfectly and beautifully is that one of the nice things about that period of time was Carol Ann and I had complete freedom to return to Latin mass. Cause now you have to remember, I don't have someone pressuring me to say, well, you better make your, you better be visible here. And that's something too. I got, I'm, now you remind me of the little details. One thing I was about to mention right before I left 
youth ministry, what was happening at that time was there was pressure on me to do a youth mass. Remember what I said from the very beginning? I told this guy, this priest, I said, I'm not going to do a youth mass ever. Well, now there's pressure on me. The parents want a youth mass. They want the teens to have a youth mass. And I said, well, I'm not going to do that. And I was being accused, well, you're being disobedient. I said, I'm sorry, we're not going to do drugs. What is a youth mass? Youth mass is like Protestant praise and worship. It's like, in other words, I mean, it's, so it's it's the Noah's sort of mass. So it's not, not just like a preacher, right? Noah's sort of mass. But the teens are much more involved. So you have teens that are doing the first reading, the second reading at you know up at the altar. Um, oftentimes, teens oh, are welcomed yeah. around the altar. You have teens who are extraordinary ministers of Holy Communion, handing you know handing out the Eucharist. You have a youth band with guitar doing praise and worship music. You know, I mean, it's all that kind of. Stuff. And I, I said, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be part of that kind of stuff. I'm not gonna do that. That's disrespectful to the mass. Um, and that was told. So okay, but so on one hand, you're already attending, you know, a mass. I'm guessing that allows Eucharistic ministers and allows a band, you know, and all of that. Was it just because it's like it becomes real to you now that now you're the one enforcing that? Yeah, that's a good way to say it. It became real that they wanted me to put it together. Whereas before, it's like I tolerate. I guess the word would be I tolerated it. Didn't think it was the right thing to do, but I tolerated it for in my mind what I thought was a greater good. Um, now it's like we want you to actively be a part of that, and I just like I can't do that, you know. So there were a lot of things that led up to me leaving that position, and um, again coming to a point in life where I thought, okay, now I'm just gonna focus entirely on me and Carol Ann growing in holiness. Wherever I work, I thought my coworkers, there's my ministry. Where if I go to a grocery store, whoever's there, there's my ministry. I, I got away from the idea of like, I need, again, I need to uh, move ahead in apologetics or all that left me. So I'm just going to live my life quietly, teach the faith when I can, pray the rosary every day, sanctify my family. That's what I'm going to do. And of course, study. I've, I've, I'm a bookworm by nature. So I've all, I'm always reading books, challenging myself on different things. And, um, the beautiful part about this, that, that whole decade was I got away. I was able to build fortitude and conviction on my own conclusions because for too many years prior, I was too focused on like, what, you know, I don't know what to think. What other people think, you know, what does Jesse think? What does Tim Staples think? What does Scott Hahn think? Well, what is what does this priest thing? Well, what, what is that? That's it. Like, what does John Lane think? What is it's What is the Genesis? It was always like, I'm reliant. And finally I'm like, I'm going to come to my own conviction, my own conclusions. And, and all that's what, that's what's going to be. When we started turning back to Latin Mass, which was awesome, and I started just doing more deep dive studies on all sorts of different topics. Where you were know, you going at the time? Uh, independent chapels. So this is where me and my current my, my Monsignor Sebastian, my current priest, where he and I first really connected. And I, we'd go to him. Uh, we had another uh, Father Patrick Perez who passed away a couple of years ago. May God, you know, may his soul rest in peace. But we go to him, um, you know, there was an SSPX chapel, just different like local Latin masses. And just, you know, peacefully, uh, we had an FSSP open near us. And it was huge, huge, huge FSSP parish that did, of course, exclusively Latin mass. We started going there. That became like our new home for a long time. Um, and I wasn't, I wasn't really going around debating anybody. I, I wasn't like looking for debates. I just kind of thought people are going to do what they're going to do. And that's what I told you in the past. I struggled at, at times. I struggled with apathy. I thought they're going to do what they're going to do. I'll do what I do. If they want to talk about it, they can talk about it. And I'll, and I'll know what I think. But other than that, I'm just doing my life, just living my life, doing my thing. And that was just kind of how I did things, you know? Um, and that was it. So, I mean, just, it was just peaceful 10 years in that way. Um, I'm trying to think if I missed anything, it was 10 years. Cause 10 years is a long time, but that was just life. Just doing different jobs, coming home, studying, reading books. Going to mass, praying the rosary, doing the works of mercy, which really was the testimony I learned from Joe Wickman's time in my life. I know God had a reason for calling him away when he did. I'm, I'm, I'm at peace with that now, but now I realize all the more so he came into my life when he did to show me that being a Catholic, and it's important for every person hearing this, being a Catholic is not just, I read all these books and I know all the things. It's not, that's not going to get you to heaven. Just having all the right things. It's not. Um, you know, now it's supposed to help you, right? To get to heaven is what? Know, love, and serve God. So it helps to know God and to know God, you know, know the truth correctly and so that you can love him so that what? So you can serve him, you know? And so that's the the break the, the breakdown of that, know, love, and serve. And um, for many years, I used to think, man, I want to be this generation St. Augustine or this generation St. Aquinas, meaning like they wrote all these books. I want to be this generation St. Anselm. I'm going to write volumes of theology and, you know, and all these things. And I thought, I used to think when I was younger, that's my ticket to heaven. 
until I realized that the, the Aquinas and Augustine and Anselm aren't in heaven because they wrote a lot of books. They're in heaven because they're holy people. You see the, 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 the distinction. They're holy. They're virtuous. They they engaged spiritual combat. They they went to war against their vices. They strove for virtue. I thought, you know, finally in that 10 years, I started to realize that's the important thing. You know, that's the first chapter of the Imitation of Christ by Thomas Akempis. First chapter says, you know, you can know all the mysteries in the world of the faith. And what does it matter if you know how to define the Trinity if you don't please the Trinity by the life you live? What does it matter if you know how to define contrition if you don't have contrition for your sins? In other words, you need to live this thing. And that was that became a reality to me is I'm going to I keep studying, but I also do my best to keep serving, to keep living because we need to do that. The, I want to make sure that message gets out there so people hear that from me. Um, I I don't I, I don't want to judge anybody. I'm going to say I know a lot of people in life in today's day and age where it's like people think they're they're, they're guaranteed they're, they're on the path to heaven because I know how to how to debate all the protestants and i know how to explain the whole crisis and i know how to say this say that and i do great instagram posts and so i'm going to it's like that's not getting you to heaven it's great if you can help people that way by instructing the ignorant okay that's great but you also have to imitate jesus you have to imitate our lord you have to imitate our lady that's how you get to heaven carrying your cross faithfully you know all that knowledge is pointless if you're not living a virtuous life or striving to live it by grace that, that that's really my main I want to emphasize right there because that's what I learned in these in that, in that decade. That's important, you know. I I focused on the works of mercy. There are so many stories I could share right now, Nina, about things that occurred in the, those ten years with people. But it, it's almost like I, I want to keep it. It's it's you know like our Lord says, um, don't go out into the public square and like rattle off all the things you do. Like you know, close your door and do it in secret, right? It's it, God knows what me and Caroline learned in the in those years when it came to the works of mercy. Um, many miracles we were able to witness, conversions, people served. And that to me is I'm content. You know, if you do it for the least of these, you do it for our Lord. So that's important. And I wish I saw more of that in traditionalism because I don't often do. In traditionalism, I see a lot of, I'm not knocking, but it's so hyper-focused on debating. Like, that's the hyper-focus. It's like, I, I want people that inspire me with charity, inspire me to grow my love for our Lord, grow my love for the church. And I, Nina, I've told you many times, as you know, now the whole world's going to find out that watches this. I've always told Nina, one of the gifts that she's brought me as a friend is to re-show me what it means to truly love Holy Mother Church. You know, um, I've learned that through Nina. Um, when I first met my current uh, pastor, Monsignor Sebastian, who's an independent bishop, um, one of the things that drew me to him uh, as a man of God is that, you know, he he knows his stuff, as Nina knows, and as those we've had him on our podcast, as you know. But also, too, he has such a heart for people. He genuinely has a heart for people, and that's what moved me. I want to imitate that example, you know. So, anyways, that that's been ten years of my life, or that was ten years until I met Nina, and um, you know, and then that's a whole other story because that was you know Nina, you know, and I talk about the faith and her learning things, and when she started to realize, you started to realize, I'm saying she, and you're right here. When he started to realize how much I knew and that I'd written articles and, you know, and then you were converting to Catholic faith. I mean, that's really right when you were like, hey, can you write an article for me to help? You know, I I started writing articles really geared towards you to learn certain things. And then all of a sudden I know we're like, hey, guess what? I have this idea. Let's do a website together and (laughs) let's collaborate in this Instagram together. And, you know, people need to read your stuff. And, you know, and that's kind of how all that starting uh, leading all up to you know anyways like well, i just couldn't and- believe i'm like he really like you really have such a way of putting things into uh words and you're so good at teaching i was like well, what is this guy doing like why isn't he why isn't he doing something with this like gift you know why is he so hermited with it and it's not that i think that um you know, you or anyone else deserves some special status. Um, you know, you would explain to me a little bit of your background and why you were kind of behind the scenes, but it's just a matter of fact that you were helping me so much understand the faith that I wanted other people to have that, mm-hmm. you know, and, um, and that's of course, all you know, the, the workers are few, the laborers are few, and it's hard to find people that, um, are willing to, you know, take the time to explain things and do it well. 
Yeah. Um, and I, I guess in that time you had, you know, learned, you know, cause you had said you had struggled with pride and like wanted to debate, but to me, your articles really, um, were so tactful and, uh, I didn't find them snarky or off-putting. And I just, I just really, I learned so much from them. And that was, you know, me asking you to write these articles because one, I was trying to learn the faith, but also because I had gained, a, you know, this small following on Instagram after being a Protestant and wanted to show other people like Catholicism is logical. It, it is scriptural. You know, the issue is your interpretation and you just knew all of that. So, you know, I was like, Joe, what are you doing? <laughs> Get out there. It's so so I did peer pressure him a little bit, but I know he well, prayed on it and all that. What's funny too is that initially, yeah, our conversations were were str only apologetics, right? I was helping you understand my Protestant was wrong, Protestant was true. Then there was a one day I remember um, you told me to say, hey, you know, have you ever heard of Lefebvre? Are you aware that there's this crisis in the church? So I'm like, well, oh yeah, trust me, I, I know. I don't and even remember that. That's so funny. I remember because you know it was a you know Eric, right? You and him had already yeah. talked about the things and. Because you know, I, I I had invited. So in case those of you don't know, I had encouraged Nina to go on a podcast with a guy that I used to listen to, and you know, he had lots of good stuff to say and about what's going on in the world, what's going on in the church. And so I said, hey, you know, you might be good on this guy's podcast because you know Nina was like a truther, right, on Instagram. At least that's how when I first met you, yeah, that's how I met you. Was like, oh, she's this truther, right? And I thought, you know, you and him could make a good podcast together, talking about things. And then I thought, and plus two, he's Catholic, so I'll be good for you, you know, and. He'll show you uh, a truth or perspective from, yeah, from a Catholic filter. But then he introduced you to the fact that, you know, yeah, there's this crisis going on. So then one day, because we don't talk apologetics. So then you you message me and you're like, hey, have you ever heard of this guy Lefebvre? And are you aware there's a crisis in the church? And I hadn't even talked. I hadn't, I hadn't opened up that door with you yet. I thought, you know, we'll get to that door eventually. Right now, I'm just trying to get her away from Protestantism into Catholicism. Like, that was my goal, you know. And all of a sudden, I'm like, oh, man, I said, if you want to open up that door, like, yeah, I have a lot I could share with you. That's well, I couldn't you know. come into the church, you know, um, until I understood, you know, because as a Protestant, you hear the church is corrupt. Yeah. So I'm like, man, is the church corrupt or is it just like people that have infiltrated the church trying to destroy it, which I didn't understand that that was like fully a possibility, um, yeah. you know, so once I realized like. Not only is this possible, but this is what's happening. I'm like, oh man, like poor Protestants because, it, and poor the Catholic Church because it's being accused and and slandered and everything our Lord went through. So of course it's yeah. his church has to. But you know, I just as soon as I saw this Lefebvre video, I remember my my tears in my which isn't hard to do. I will tear up over everything, but I had tears in my eyes, <laughs> and I was like. Oh man, like this is the church and she's she's under attack. Yeah. And so of course I had to ask you, you were one of the only Catholics I, you know, could talk to. And yeah. Yeah. It's true. And and I remember I mean you, this happened a few times, but oh, since you and I have met and become friends and all that, I mean, uh, you know, the, the I remember early on when you would say things to me like I'm weeping right now, and I would say, What's wrong? And you would say, I'm weeping for the church. And it's it, like I said, it had a profound e impact on me. I thought, wow. And I remember telling you one time, I haven't, I haven't wept for the Holy Mother Church in a long time, and that moved me tremendously. Um, and other, you know, things like that that you and I know. It's just, but, but you know, that that example uh, inspired me, continues to. And then your fortitude inspired me with uh, your conviction, how you learn things. This is you know, one of the blessings. I always said we met at the perfect time. You and I had we met six, you know, at different times, it wouldn't have worked. But we met at a good time in your life and in my life. And it's nice because when you met me, again, you met me at a time where I'd come off 10 years in my hibernation mode, but just studying, living the faith, growing in my knowledge, and, and hopefully by God's grace, growing in holiness, but also, too, growing in my conviction, growing in my confidence, growing in fortitude. I didn't have to depend on what other people told me anymore, or what other people thought. I just thought, this is where I stand. This is where me and my wife stand. So you, you met me at a time where I felt much more confident discussing issues about the church with somebody. Or I said, you met me, I don't know, 10, 15 years, or whatever. Yeah, I, I, I just would have been a different person. I don't really know. I don't know what to think. I'm, you, know, you know, it just was different. Um, that's why I tell people I've been all over the spectrum because I bounced everywhere for a long time trying to find, to make sense of things, trying to find the truth. And 
the things I, you know, if you look at Return the King's Instagram or our website, the articles I've written the past couple of years, the posts we've done, you'll get a taste for where, you know, where I, I come from and all this, uh, the, the accumulation effect of all that I've studied, you know, and lived and seen and experienced. Um, and I was, I've been, it's nice because I've been able then to share that with you. And I, I said, you know, thanks to Carol Ann that you and I met because it wouldn't have happened had Carol Ann not had her eyes open to what was going on in 2020. Um, she did. And so she started looking for other Instagrammers, quote unquote, influencers, truthers, whatever, people that were like minded with her. And somehow at some point in life, she came across your reel that, it, you know, had gone viral talking about COVID and the world and all that stuff and the lockdowns. And, and, you know, you, you, you tapped into something deep within her spirit and she started to follow you. And she's telling me, Joe, Joe, like, babe, you, you know, you gotta, you gotta check out this girl, Janine Leone. You gotta, you gotta listen to her. And, and I, I, I was kind of like, you know, I wasn't big. I mean, I, I held the exact identical same convictions, but I was, just was not interested on like following truth or accounts at all. You oh, know? yeah, so, I don't blame you. Yeah, I was just like, eh. So, you know, for a long time, she's like, you got to follow me and Leone. And I'm just like, eh, yeah, I don't know. And she sounds like, you, you got to follow her. I'm like, yeah, maybe one day. You know, I just didn't care, really. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, um, that, in, you know, anyways, then came the day where I uh, I went on your account. Uh, you had asked uh, one of those Q and a stories, asked me a question. I'm like, what are your thoughts on Fatima? Cause uh, that was my favorite thing to ask truthers is if you're a legit truther, I want to see how you take Fatima. Cause Fatima again is a story that I think confounds everything. I, I, I want to hear. You, sorry. Yeah. And you and I began talking and DMS here and there a little bit. And um, even then it's funny. Cause then Caroline put on, on me, babe, she's like, you got to help her come to the Catholic church. She's called to be Catholic. You know, and I think I think maybe she might be Protestant. I don't know, but she's called me Catholic. You got you got to be willing to help her. That's why God wants you guys to talk. And I'm just like Caroline, like come on, like just you talk to her. Like let me just I, I have work, I have life, like I'm busy, and you know that was me initially. I that's just you know kind of kind of kept me stop being a grumpy old man, you know. <laughs> um, but that's why I reached out that one day about Fatima, just like a kind of pine of seed. What are your thoughts? We can start talking and. One thing led to another. Next thing you know, you're becoming Catholic. I mean, you know, it just was crazy to see it. And um, I thought at that point, okay, I've done my job. I help you get to the church. Now, you know, it's over. Um, here's my 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 this guy. I don't know him, Eric. He has a podcast. He's going to help you the rest of the way. So, you know, go to him. Yeah, he, and, he, he did help me a lot for sure. But, yeah. you know, I wouldn't have, you know, met him had it not been for you. And then you filled in all the gaps, you know, for me. And mm -hmm. I'm still filling in certain things, you know, I'm always learning new stuff, but yeah, I, I genuinely am so happy that you came out a little bit and you've written so many articles and I mean, really not only me, but helped so many, you know, understand, um, basic apologetics. And yeah. I think that has to be coupled with, um, talking to a degree about the crisis because for a Protestant, um, their argument is based on, well, we, we're not part of the Catholic church because it's corrupt. So then they see everything going on yeah. and they're like, well, you see, it's still corrupt. And that's where it's like, okay, you can't sweep that under the rug. It didn't work for me when people tried. Yeah. So it, it has to be talked about. And you had a little bit of both of that. Yeah. Was like, I just was like, Hey, <laughs> By yeah. the way, we should do this. It worked out. I, it's funny because I remember telling Caroline initially, you know, my my hesitancy in talking more with you initially was it it nothing to do with you. It was just simply like it sounds weird, but I thought I don't I wasn't looking to become I, I didn't want to leave my hibernation status. I don't want to become a known person, you know, and it sounds weird, but I thought it was like, you know, let's say you and I start talking more. What if you start sharing my posts on something? Now I have 20,000 eyeballs wanting to see. And that's like, I don't want to do that right now. Like, I just like, I, I work my job, come home with my life. That's what I do, you know? And that's what it was. As you know, it was almost like pulling teeth to get me out of that. Um, But again, it, it, you know, I it, I took it like a work of mercy initially. When you said, hey, can you write me an article? Like, why is infant baptism wrong? I mean, why, why do we do infant baptism? Why are the Protestants wrong? Or I'm like, oh, I can do this. I'll write an article for you. And. Then, you know, you told me, hey, do you know that there's a crisis in the church? And I'm like, yeah, I do. And you're like, you know, can you write me an article about no salvation outside the church? And that was my first real. That was such a hang up for me was that yeah. dogma initially. And the thing is, that article, 
people that have read it right know it encompasses not just how to answer Protestants, but also modernism. So that's when I started to realize, you know, that article I remember was such a big help for you. And I realized, you know what, I can't, like, I need to be okay with just you and I, like, talking more. You know, I have to be okay with that on, and wherever it goes, it goes. It's up to God. And, of course, then, you know, I, I know what I know, we actually end up developing, like, an actual friendship. And we're talking all the time and discussing the faith, discussing the crisis and Protestantism. And, yeah, and that's how it led to you saying at one point, hey, let's do a website together. You know, God put this in my heart, and I really think we should, and we should devote it to Our Lady and to the souls in purgatory. and. I was like, yeah, you know, we, we definitely should. And I, I knew by that point, okay, like if God wants me to get back out there in a the sense, then I will, you know. Um, so, you know, but again, he used you really as, as a way of helping me on that. And of course, like said, Carol and my dad for years were praying for me. Like, you know, Carol told me, babe, you have so much knowledge. My dad, son, you have so much knowledge. Like, you need to be out there teaching people, you know. So um, it's interesting, but. Yeah, it's, it's something I love to do, and um, and so I mean I you know you know right I mean how grateful I've been to start returning the king with you this podcast the website and all those things and um I it's it's such a blessing from God to see the number of people that have people that have messaged us their stories of how this ministry has assisted them or helped them by the grace of God and we're just like wow I mean I and I describe it all the years that I did youth ministry you know, I mean you know it's like I remember I told you before, I might see one or two people have a legit change of life or conversion, but now it's like we're, I, we've seen so many. And I, I've heard people tell me, if you know one person who converted to the truth because of something that God did through you, that's that right there is a life testament. That's what Monsignor told me. But if you know two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then it's like, this is pretty crazy. You know, that that's not normal, in other words. But God's been doing great things through this ministry. Um. And, you know, we, we see his hand in it. So then that's why we persist. And obviously at times, you know, things happen in life and we, one of us will kind of take a break over the other. Um, hence oh, yeah. the, past, yeah, the, the past month I've been, you know, being in the hospital, have the stroke, and, you know, um, and I just had to slow down for a bit. And, you know, and you've been so good about being patient with me on that. But I just, just so all, all of you know, I told Nina, like, I just need um, some time to just recuperate. I mean, it, you know, um, that's what I've been doing, but it's nice to to do this podcast with you here today, though, and kind of. Yeah, I think these are like easy going. You know, um, they don't require you to log into social media and deal with all the hounding. You know, it's just you and me talking, which we do all the time about this stuff anyway. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, I forget people are watching this or are going to watch it. It's just like you and I are talking yeah. on the phone, you know. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. So it's easy. It's easy to, in, in my opinion. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for, you know, sharing your your testimony and your story and everything you've been through in the past few months, which is just, I mean, it's a lot. Um, yeah. Any closing thoughts that you haven't touched on that you wanted to or? Um, um, one thing I just remembered, and this is, all, this is on me, is that you would ask me at the beginning before we went live, so make, can you lead us in opening prayer? And I didn't. We just took right into right. talking. But but we're gonna close in prayer. <laughs> okay, okay. You know what? That was my fault because I yeah I had asked you, but it's my. I fault. was so nervous about trying to get this. We're not tech savvy over here yeah. on a school you. So I just I was anxious. And I we were having I'm audio issues. In Nick, yeah, no. It's you had told me you said I'm gonna go live. We're gonna do the intro, then lead us in prayer, then I'll start talking. I said sure, and then we st we just start. <laughs> we jumped right into. Peace. <laughs> I've done this like twice now, so Lord <laughs> forgive me. But yes, right. you can close in prayer. Okay. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy, Holy Mary, Mary, Mother of God, God, pray for us. Now at the hours of our death. Amen. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our defense against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. Do thou, Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits throughout the world, seeking the ruin of souls. St. Joseph, pray for us. St. Nicholas, pray for us. St. Joan of Arc, pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Joe. It was nice meeting you. <laughs> nice meeting you, Nina.
<laughs> How do I turn this thing off? Okay, bye. <laughs>